Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for today's free webinar, Bringing Your Startup to the United States, with John Bridenstine from the U.S. Embassy London, uh, Daniel Glazer from Freed Frank, Ben Parkinson from the U.S. Department of State, and Glenn McRae from Early Growth Financial Services. My name is Erica Malsberg, and I'm the Chief Marketing Officer for Early Growth Financial Services, and I'll be your moderator today. This presentation is going to run about 40 minutes. If you have questions as we go along, please feel free to enter them right into the chat field. You can also tweet them to us at EarlyGrowthFS with the hashtag BringingStartupToUS. We're going to try and answer the questions as they come, um, or we'll wait until the Q&A at the end to address them. We'll also be sending out a follow-up email tomorrow that will contain a link to the recording and the deck, and we'll make sure that we can answer all your questions by then if we haven't had a chance in the Q&A portion. I want to start by introducing our presenters today. Uh, first of all, we're pleased to have with us today Daniel Glazer. Dan leads the technology practice at Freed Frank, a leading New York-based international law firm with offices throughout the U.S., Europe, and Asia. Dan is resident in the firm's New York and London offices, where he works with some of the world's largest companies in their most significant technology-focused transactions, as well as emerging companies seeking to expand to the United States. He regularly partners with government organizations and accelerators, including Techstars, London um, Seed Camp, and Startup Boot Camp, to provide early stage companies with access to legal and multidisciplinary mentoring and U.S. expansion. He's also authored the comprehensive Coming to America, a U.S. legal guide for non-U.S. companies. And Tech City News recently named Dan one of the top 10 international connectors in London's tech community. So uh, good morning or good afternoon and welcome to you, Daniel. Morning. Uh, we also have with us today John Bridenstine, uh, Minister Counsel for Commercial Affairs, U.S. Embassy London. John arrived in the United Kingdom as Minister Counselor for Commercial Affairs. His previous assignments included U.S. Consul General in Hermosillo, Mexico, and Regional Director for Commercial Service Operations in Europe and Eurasia, as well as postings in Mexico City, Kabul, Ankara, Tashkent, Kuwait City, and Munich. Before joining the Foreign Service, John worked for International Paper. He's a 1984 graduate of Davidson College in North Carolina and studied international relations at the University of Miami and Free University of Berlin. Uh, good morning and welcome to you, John. Thank you very much, Erica. Sure. We also have uh, Ben Parkinson, Treaty Visa Analyst for the U.S. Department of State. Ben is the sole analyst in the U.K. for the U.S. State Department's E-1 and E-2 Treaty Trader and Treaty Investor Visa programs for foreign companies who are looking to set up operations in the United States. To date, he's performed over 1,700 comprehensive reviews on UK, European businesses seeking a business visa to the US. So welcome to you, Ben. Good morning. Good morning. And uh, last but certainly not least, we have our own Glenn McRae. Glenn is Chief Strategy Officer for Early Growth Financial Services, an outsourced financial services firm that provides accounting, CFO, strategic finance, tax, and valuation services to small to mid-sized companies throughout the US. And Glenn is an experienced CPA with extensive early stage company experience. So welcome to you, Glenn. Thank you, Erica. Sure. And then, Glenn, why don't you go ahead and uh, kick us off and let everyone know what we're going to be talking about today. Sure. Thanks. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with everybody here today. Um, basically, what we're trying to accomplish with this presentation today is to help people who are, are thinking about why would you want to take your business, which is an early stage growth company, over to the United States. Why would you want to do that? Um, and then, you know, if, you, if you're just basically curious trying to, to think things through a little bit, there are obviously practical considerations that you want to address when you come over to the States. And you're probably going to put a plan together as you think about coming over to the States. So what we're trying to do is to give you those things that you should put on your to-do list as you're building your plan to give you an idea about things you need to address to make sure you do things properly when you get over here to the States. Um, you'll have a much better roadmap for success if you kind of understand what you're going to be getting into when you get over here to the US. So some of those practical considerations are going to be how do you go about getting over here? Um, what are some of the legal considerations? Any business is going to have legal issues that they have to deal with. When you want to grow your business and you want to add staffing, what are the things you need to think about? Um, as you add staff, as you yourself come over here, what are the kinds of business visas and visa requirements that you need to establish so that you can be properly registered here in the United States? 
And then as you get your business up and going, um, what are the kinds of issues you're going to need to deal with so that you can run your business properly, keep your investors informed about your business progress, and keep your company in good compliance? So I think the first thing that we'd like to convey to you is this concept of a startup ecosystem. And I think that term ecosystem might be a little trite as it's applied to the business world, but there really is an interaction of different players here um, within the entire business life cycle of a company. So if you think about it, you're focused on getting a business up and off the ground. You're very insular in your focus. You're looking at your internal operations. But you really do need the help of others if you're going to achieve great success with your business. So you know, some of those things are going to be strategic partners who are going to be your customers. Um, if you're ultimately going to try to exit your business and sell it out to a larger entity, um, who would those potential strategic partners be? Um, your funding uh, partners. So who's going to actually put capital into your business? You may have acquired capital at the very earliest stage, at, at the bootstrapped or seed stage, maybe even at the A stage. But as you grow your business and look to take advantage of greater opportunities, we're going to be those bigger investors who want to write bigger checks, who are anxious to write bigger checks with companies that don't have earnings yet, um, but have a great business model. That's, that's the, the, the basic part of the ecosystem that a lot of people um, are going to be thinking about coming over to the United States to tap into. But you know, once you get over here, um, it's really helpful to have other business partners who understand what startups need to go through, that have tailored their business model to actually be an asset to you as your business. So some of these service providers are the legal side. You know, we have. Dan Glazer with Fried Frank to talk about that. The banking side, there's a number of banks that are really focused on startup companies, companies that don't even have assets yet, but will lend to you and will do other banking services to make your life easier. Accounting firms such as ours who have tailored high level service at an at a affordable price point and understand all of the issues that a startup company is going to have to deal with so that you don't have to anticipate all those issues, we can anticipate them for you. And then on the human resource side, there are ways of adding staffing and dealing with the, the payroll responsibilities and, and human resource issues that can make your life a lot easier when you're trying to run your business so that you can just focus on the core milestones that you have to achieve to assert a, a, a successful business model for your company. So when you add it all up and think about it, when you pull all these things together, the sum is really greater than the parts that make it up. And that's what we're trying to convey to you is what is that ecosystem. And as we look at each one of the different places in the United States, um, we have the, the benefit of having John Bridenstine here with the, the U.S. Department of Commerce who can kind of point out some of the different aspects of the different parts of the United States that you might want to think about. John, yeah, okay. are you with us? Yeah, I'm with you. Yeah, thanks so much, Glenn. Anyway, it's great to be with you all. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending upon where you are. Um, it's great to be part of this webinar. And as Glenn said, we'll be sharing with you some practical aspects of launching your businesses in the United States. However, I think you know, I wanted to point out that these presentations that we're here to give to you today are only as good as the content that we provide and the value that it brings to you. So I would encourage you, as Erica said, to ask your questions, give us some feedback, and if there are things that we are missing, let us know. We'll try to cover them over the course of this presentation. So um, you know, I think you'd like to take a couple minutes about uh, to talk about the United States as your prospective new home. Um, as you see from the next slide, uh, you know, President Obama, Eric, if you could, yeah, there you go. Um, there's no better place in the world to do business than the United States of America. I mean, obviously, you're part of this webinar today. You recognize the opportunities that exist there, but. But why is it? Why does the president believe that there's no better place? I mean, we've got a talented workforce, lucrative consumer market, a strong R&D base, an IP protection, transparent legal system, high developed infrastructure, robust supply chains, and, and the list goes on and on. Um, if you look at the second quad, the upper right quad, you'll see, uh, you know, 
bunch of figures there, and, and this is really why do we care? Why does the United States care about this uh, FDI or, or companies like yours going to the U.S. to launch and to scale? Uh, the U.S. is already home to more FDI than any other country in the world. That's what that number one stands for. Um, and actually, the next number is 22.2 percent of all exports from the United States, that's $343 billion in 2012, come from U.S. subsidiaries of foreign-owned firms. So we recognize the importance that foreign direct investment in the United States plays because it is responsible for so much of our exports. And, and obviously that's all about creating jobs and growth in the United States. 6.3 million jobs, U.S. workers, are created by those U.S. Uh, subsidiaries of foreign-owned firms. And again, another very significant number for us. And $55.5 billion. I mean, that's the R&D that those subsidiaries have invested in the United States. So whether we're talking about, you know, the exports generated by those subsidiaries, we're talking about the jobs created, you know, we're talking about the R&D it's all about jobs and growth, and, and it's our hope that through webinars such as these, through other events that we do, boot camps that we run in the name of Select USA Tech, it's all about getting companies like yours to the United States to launch and to scale and to create the kinds of job and the kinds of growth that we're looking for in the United States. And so, so that upper right quad is, is all about why it's important to us. So if we move down to, to the third quad or the bottom left, it's really why should you care? Um, that number 310 is now reported over 320 million, the consumer market in the United States. If you look at the United States as a gateway to Canada and Mexico and, and other markets where we have free trade agreements, again, it opens up a you know, tremendous amount of opportunity for companies like yours that are, you know, maybe have success in Europe and are looking to go to the United States to launch and to scale and really want to use the United States as a gateway to the, to the rest of the Western Hemisphere. So again, uh, tremendous opportunities uh, related to that. 55% um, 55 of the global ICT research and development takes place in the United States and 40% is the U.S. market share of all tech purchases globally. So if you're looking for a place to launch and scale your startup, one that's had success in Europe or elsewhere in the world, and you're looking to, to tap into that market as the United States, there really is no better place for startups uh, to have success than the United States of America. We've got great role models. We've got access to funding. We've got a great business infrastructure, as I pointed out, you know, distribution, monetization capabilities. We've got talent. We've got practice management. Uh, production and, and, and sheer serendipity. So, you know, I think being here uh, with us today, you recognize the opportunities that exist in the United States and, and really, as is, is I think uh, Glenn had pointed out, it's really about business partners, it's about the networks that you develop. And, and I think you, know, you all uh, who are joining us here today should really consider us among your, your networks, among your partners, because as Glenn pointed out, and I know as, as Ben and, and Dan will point out after me, it's really about you know, doing what we can to facilitate your entry into the United States and, uh, and, and really to create the kinds of jobs and, and growth that, that we are looking to do. Now going down to the uh, fourth quad, the bottom right hand corner, Select USA. Select USA is an initiative that came out of the Obama administration in 2011. And obviously, as I mentioned, we are all already home to, to the uh, more FDI than any other country in the world, but we recognize that you know, we need to be doing a better job to facilitate the FDI, to facilitate the activities of companies like yours in the United States, and, and that's, what, that's what we're here to work on through Select USA. Select USA is based in Washington out of the U.S. Department of Commerce, but it really is an interagency effort, uh, whether it be State Department, EPA, Department of Labor, Department of Transportation, um, all the various agencies uh, outside of commerce and inside of commerce, such as the National Institute for Standards and Technology and others, um, you know, we really are there to help you in terms of getting your, your businesses launched and scaled uh, in the United States. And so really feel free to call on us, consider us among your partners within your network. And, and we've got in investment specialists in major markets around the world. We've got offices throughout the United States really to, to assist you no matter where you are, uh, you know, West Coast, East Coast, uh, Middle America, we're really there to, to assist. 
Um, the Select USA Investment Summit, you see that referred to in the bottom right hand or uh, bottom right quad, and that is coming up later this month, the 23rd and the 24th. It's really giving uh, potential investors and companies, small, medium, and large, looking to launch in the U.S., an opportunity to network with a wide variety of high government officials, corporate experts, um, learn about federal, state, local laws and incentives, one-to-one -one meetings with federal and state investment promotion agency officials. There's going to be a Monday afternoon panel on startup resources. There are panels on immigration, panels on protecting your IP, a panel on business accelerators and, you know, and what they can do for small, medium-sized companies looking to launch in the U.S. There's also a, a Sunday uh, academy for small, medium-sized companies. So, I mean, I recommend you check out the website, the Select USA. Uh, dot, dot com or dot gov rather website and find information about the summit. Really a tremendous amount of information that exists. Um, in the time that remains, Erica, if you can go to the next slide, I want to talk to you a little bit um, about uh, some of the resources that we've got uh, available on the selectusa.gov website. Here you see the home page and I want to just highlight just a couple things. If you look on the toolbar up at the top, you'll see something there about resources. And so we just have some screenshots here. We're not live, but Eric, if you can go to the next slide, if you click on that resources bar, you're going to come to something called the cluster mapping tool. And this is something that was de developed by Harvard Business School together with the U.S. Economic Development Administration of the Department of Commerce. And it highlights clusters, trade clusters and local clusters throughout the United States. And you can plug in whatever uh, search uh, aspects or variables that you like to get the kind of information that you want about your peer customers or your customer, about your peers or about your customers, about where those clusters are around the United States. And so, for example, here we just gave a screenshot of one search that we did based on establishments and in information technology and analytical instruments, and you can sort it by, you know, uh, metro, metropolitan statistics or you can sort it by state, but really I think you know, the kind of information that you can derive from the cluster mapping tool will help you to determine where you really need to be. Where are your peers? You know, where are your customers potentially in the United States? And many of you already may have a good idea uh, based on your industry or based on what you're working on where you need to be, but I think this is a great tool that will enable you to sort of identify uh, where in the United States you need to be. And so if you can go on to the next uh, page, Erica, this was on the, the home page when you go to selectusa.gov. It's a map of the United States, clearly. You can click on any one of those states and it will take you directly to that state's website and all that it offers for potential investors in terms of incentives and benefits and so on. So if you sort of narrow it down from the cluster mapping tool, the two or three states where you need to be, then you can go into this map and click on those states and we'll take you to those states' websites away from the selectusa.gov website onto the states' websites and again give you a whole host of information about the incentives and benefits that they offer. If you go to the next one, uh, among the resources uh, toolbar that I referred to is this is just a, a static list, but it's updated on a regular basis of select USA contact list for all the states and the territories. So, you know, you can go on here and you can get the email addresses, telephone numbers, the names of the people within the states that really can give you the granular information about the opportunities that exist in those states. And then finally, if you go to the last slide uh, for me, Erica, and this is a great site on the State Business Incentives Database. As I said, on that other map of the United States, you can click and you can get the websites from the different states. On this map, it's just about the incentives that are offered by the various states. So if you click on the state you see over on the right-hand side, it will give you a list of all the incentives, uh, grants and, and financing and other incentives that are offered by the various states. So, I mean, it really is a wealth of information and, and I've really just touched on the tip of the iceberg uh, with regard to the selectusa.gov website. So I really commend it to you and, again, and if you have any questions later in the webinar, I'd be happy to answer them. And with that, uh, I'll turn it over to uh, my friend Dan Glazer. Dan? Great. Thank, thanks, John, and good, good day to everybody. Um, so to keep today's uh, legal di discussion simple, uh, I'm going to focus on five key legal issues to consider when expanding to the U.S. Now, for a more complete overview, we, we've made our Coming to America legal guide available at our website, uh, tech.freedfrank.com. So the, the first point um, is to consider your corporate structure. 
So early stage planning on creating a U.S. entity helps ensure that you're doing business in the most tax, advantage, tax advantageous way possible and helps shield your non-U.S. company from potential U.S. litigation and other li liability. And there are a number of decision points here. The first is, do you open as a branch, a subsidiary, or as, as, a, as a parent company? In other words, do you want to create a U.S. branch, a U.S. sub, or a U.S. parent? Now, a, a branch in the U.S. typically is not advisable. There, there's the, the potential for U.S. liability to be attributed directly to the non-U.S. company, and you'll potentially end up with two different tax authorities claiming against the same income. There's not as clear an answer as to subsidiary versus parent in, in the U.S. So generally speaking, U.S. Um, VC investors will typically want to, to see a non-U.S. company in the U.S. before investing. Now, historically, that's meant not only just setting up a physical presence in the U.S., but also creating a U.S. top company over your non-U.S. company. However, for companies based in relatively lower tax jurisdictions like the U.K. and Ireland, among others, many U.S. investors are starting to, to see the benefits of having a non-U.S. parent company with a U.S. subsidiary, particularly in light of all the media attention that so-called inversion transactions have received in the past couple years such as Pfizer's attempted acquisition of AstraZeneca. A significant reason, as was reported in the media, for Pfizer's interest in AstraZeneca was the potential to create a top company in the, the, the UK, where the, effect, where the effective corporate tax rate is about half of the United States when you combine US ta state and federal taxes. So companies that start in countries like the UK and Ireland and establish US subsidiaries then come with these sorts of tax advantages already built in, which can potentially help future valuation. Now, that being said, not all U.S. VC investors feel this way, and in fact, there are VC funds that will be limited by their private placement memoranda to investing only in U.S. companies. So it's, it's a bit of a judgment call as to which route you, you go, whether or not to establish a U.S. sub or a U.S. parent company, but the key takeaway is that it's important to think about this issue ahead of time. And to be clear, a substantial presence in the U.S., typically a founder or a strong team, is still generally expected to get US VC investment. So a second decision point is corporate form. And the, 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 the two most common forms by far are a corporation and a limited liability company in the United States. So some, some of the uh, benefits of, of a corporation, it's a, probably the longest recognized US corporate form. It's, for, it's, it's very common. Investors and contracting counterparties are comfortable with it. Um, a corporation um, is, is taxed uh, directly by, by the U.S. tax authorities, the Internal Revenue Service, for its activities. And there are, are more corporate form formalities associated with, 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 a corporate, with a corporation. You need to have regular board meetings, keep uh, meeting minutes, and similar activities. Now, a limited liability company, an LLC, is a much newer form. Not all investors and other companies are comfortable with it. On the other hand, its main benefit is flexibility. There are fewer corporate formalities. And when it's a subsidiary of the non-U.S. company, you typically can choose whether the U.S. company or the non-U.S. company will be taxed um, by the U.S. tax authorities. So we're, we're, we're typically seeing corporations more often than not when companies expand to the U.S. I think because primarily because that form raises somewhat, somewhat fewer questions with investors, but ultimately either a corporation or an LLC work, work, works well. Um, so the third decision point is the state of incorporation. Now, as you may know, the U.S. is made up of 50 different states, each with, it, with its own laws, and you can establish a company in any of them. That being said, um, Delaware is very often the state of choice for incorporation. Um, there are a number of reasons for this. Uh, it's a quick and efficient incorporation process in Delaware. Delaware has very good laws for, for, for protecting companies, um, and it raises few, few, fewer questions among potential investors. They're very used to seeing Delaware companies. But maybe the, the, the best reason as to why Delaware is most commonly used is that it gives, it gives the company flexibility to move. Um, Delaware has become so common that lawyers all over the, the, the U.S., whether they're in New York or California or elsewhere, will be willing to advise on Delaware cor corporate law. Um, and that's very, very, very helpful in, in the event that you want to set up your, your headquarters um, you know, in, in another state where it's not necessarily filled with, with, with Delaware qualified lawyers. Um, this is not necessarily going to be as easy if you incorporate in another state. For, for example, if you incorporate in New York, it may be difficult if you put your headquarters in California to find a New York lawyer uh, advising on, on corporate matters. Now, to, to, be, to be clear, incorporating in Delaware doesn't mean that you need to put your office there. 
In fact, it's very, very typical for a company to incorporate in Delaware and put its corporate headquarters um, and its main offices in a place like New York or California or Texas or Illinois. You simply need to register to do business in the states outside of Delaware in which you maintain an office or otherwise have a significant business presence. So moving on to the, to the next issue, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about intellectual property. <clears throat> so I'll focus primarily on U.S. trademarks, patents, and non-disclosure agreements. So with respect to trademarks, it's important to make sure that, you're, that, that, that your trademark is cleared for use in the U.S. and that you protect it against unauthorized use by, by, by others. You don't want to invest time and effort in your brand only to be forced to stop using it or find yourself unable to protect it. So a couple things to keep in mind. First, your non-U.S. trademark registration doesn't give you U.S. protection. In other words, trademarks are jurisdiction specific. Second, keep in mind that unregistered brands get very broad protection in the United States. Although a registration does provide the, the owner of a registration with significant benefits, a company that's already in the U.S using a, a trademark, even without a registration, can stop a later company from using that mark in connection with similar products or services in the U.S. And third, not only might pre-existing identical marks create an issue for you coming into the U.S., but also similar var variations will, will be given protection. And the example that I always give is, is that, is that you, you, may, you, may, you, you may search uh, for the mark Coca-Cola spelled with all Ks and find that nobody's using that. But that doesn't mean that you can come in and start selling soda in the United States uh, under the mark Coca-Cola spelled with all Ks, that there's a very large company in Atlanta, Georgia that might have, a, have an issue with that. And, that, and that's because Coca-Cola spelled with all Ks is going to be seen to be too similar to Coca-Cola spelled with Cs. So as a result, searching the U.S. Trademark Office website doesn't mean that you're clear to use your mark in the U.S. And it's typically worth having your U.S. Trademark lawyer commission a, a full trademark clearance search by a, a, a trademark search provider um, to, insert, to ensure that there's nothing already being used in the U.S. that could cause a problem. Now, if you are clear to use your mark, you'll likely want to file to register your mark even if U.S. expansion isn't immediately imminent. As a non-U.S. company, you can file based simply on a, on a real intent to eventually use the mark in U.S. or based on your existing filing in another country. In fact, unlike a U.S.-based company, you can even obtain a U.S. registration based solely on a registration in another company with, uh, sorry, in another country without use in, in the U.S. So the next point with, with respect to patents, um, if you are going to take, take a look at going to the U.S., you want to take a fresh look at, at, at patents. Um, there's broader patent protection available in the U.S. than in other jurisdictions for software and software-enabled business methods and software-enabled inventions. So you'll, you'll want to potentially talk to a U.S. patent lawyer and see if it makes sense um, to seek patent protection in, 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 in the U.S. And also, if you are thinking about going to the U.S., to have your non-U.S. patent lawyer think about U.S. patenting standards when, when formulating a global patenting strategy. And then finally, with respect to non-disclosure agreements, so these are very important for, for protecting your, your confidential information. And I wanted to touch on a couple of points about U.S. market practices. So first of all, keep in mind that U.S. VC investors typically will not sign non-disclosure agreements, especially at an early stage. You need to be aware, rather, of who has a good reputation and be careful about giving away core trade secrets early on in potential investment di discussions. For other U.S. business and contracting parties, those you're negotiating potential commercial deals with, it is very typical to use a non-disclosure agreement when exchanging confidential in, in, in information. You should think strongly about doing so. Now, there's increasingly a trend in the U.S. toward time-limited non-disclosure agreements where the confidentiality obligations expire after an agreed number of years. This means that whatever you disclose can essentially be, be posted on the Internet after that period. Now, it's important that you pay attention to this issue in what otherwise looks like a standardized document. And if you don't have enough bargaining leverage to modify it, You'll need to pay close attention to what you're disclosing over the course of your business relationship with that entity to ensure that you don't get um, tripped up by that time-limited confidentiality ob obligation. So a third primary con consideration um, is, is to create U.S.-specific terms and conditions. As a general matter, if your U.S. counterparty has, has, has bargaining leverage in your negotiations, it's our experience that they'll often resist entering into a contract governed by non-U.S. law you're much more likely to get your U.S. counterparty to accept or start from your standard terms and conditions if they're governed by the laws of a U.S. state. 
Now that being said, if it's a large company with lots of bargaining leverage, you're still unlikely to get them to, to accept your form necessarily, but still, even if you're forced to work from their form, having your own U.S. form at the ready will give you an arsenal of provisions that you may want to try to incorporate into your, 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 your counterparty's standardized form. Now keep in mind that there's no such thing as, as so-called U.S. contract law. And rather, you'll, you'll typically pick the law of a, of a U.S. state that bears some relation to where your primary place of business is. And it, actually, this is another benefit of incorporating in Delaware, that you'll often see companies um, from, from different states, let's say one from New York and one from California, argue over which law sh should, should govern their contract. They'll often end up compromising on Delaware because they're both incorporated there. As an aside, um, state contract laws are broadly similar around the U.S., but there can be significant differences. Keep in mind that the larger commercial centers, New York, California, Texas, Illinois, and others, typically have much more well-developed and more predictable contract laws in states with somewhat less commercial activity. So the, the fourth issue I'll cover off on the legal side is the U.S. litigation landscape. Now, for better or for worse, the U.S. is highly litigious, which results in a more aggressive business culture. There are fewer disincentives to litigate in the U.S. than in other jurisdictions. Unlike, for example, in the U.K. and many other jurisdictions, the loser doesn't typically pay the winner's legal fees in U.S. Lit lit litigation. Um, additionally, filing a lawsuit in the U.S. can be relatively inexpensive, but defending can be relatively costly, especially because each side in a U.S. litigation can demand information and documents from, 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 from the other. As a result, litigation often is used as a business tool um, to force settlement or, or, or otherwise drive potentially favorable bu business outcomes. And something like 95% of all U.S. litigation gets settled before resolution at, 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 at trial. Companies often will settle disputes out of court to avoid litigation expenses, even if they believe they have a better case against the other party, because it's cheaper to pay a settlement than actually to win in litigation. Now, there are a few ways to mitigate the, these risks. Um, first of all, insurance. I mean, you, you can get insurance typically at a reasonable cost to protect against many different kinds of U.S. litigation risks. Um, many companies in the U.S. have rigorous compliance programs. It's important to make sure you're complying with the terms of your contracts and any applicable U.S. laws. And then finally, clear and unambiguous contracts. It's important to make sure that both sides to a contract know what they're signing in the U.S. Very often, U.S. litigation results from contracts that are ambiguous. Each party thinks a given provision means something different. Our experience is that, the, is that the better the contract you enter into, the less likely you are to have future disputes. And then finally, as a last point, um, don't, don't overpay or underutilize lawyers. Now, getting these initial legal points right is not in reinventing the wheel, and getting high-quality early-stage legal services should be relatively cost-effective. And as Glenn noted at the outset, many U.S. providers, legal and otherwise, are willing to, to offer early stage services on a fixed fee basis so that there's transparency up front and an ability to accurately budget for expected legal and other advisory costs. You should insist up front to understand the services you'll be provided and how much they'll cost. Now that being said, the litigation landscape does create a somewhat less forgiving business culture and creates a real incentive to getting things right the first time. Now while, while, while the issues that, that we covered are typically relatively inexpensive to get right at the outset, they can be costly to fix later, and perhaps more so than in other jurisdictions, it's important to not try to go it alone and to use your legal and other advisors appropriately so that you can concentrate on your own core, core business. So next up, um, Ben Parkinson from the U.S. Uh, Department of State in London um, will talk a little bit about U.S. immigration matters. Oh, wonderful. <clears throat> Thanks, Dan. Um, hi, my name is Ben Parkinson. I'm the e-visa analyst here at the U.S. Embassy in London. Um, I've been in the job for about five years now, and uh, it's, it's a wonderful job because I'm the guy that gets to sit behind the desk and review all the businesses that are moving to America. So I get to, I get to see all sorts of businesses, and we see lots and lots of tech startup businesses. Um, after doing this for five years, we, we realized to actually starting a business. The, the, the scariest thing you could possibly do is to come in and apply for a business visa to move to America. We find people are absolutely terrified of that. And because of that, we've we put together a few slides that will hopefully demystify the process, show you it's rational, and then hopefully point you in the right direction. All right. Um, first of all, America is open for business. Um, we don't know where this myth comes from that America is unbusiness friendly, especially the tech startups. 
every day I see dozens and dozens of businesses moving to states, and that's just from here alone. In the worldwide, we're probably talking thousands of businesses each day move to the states, and many of those businesses are small tech start businesses, just like your own. But before you do that, before you rush out and demand a visa to move to the state, let's just talk about the process real quick. There's um there's four primary business visas for the United States. Um, the first one is the ESSA, which is commonly known as the Visa Waiver Program, uh, the B1, B2 Business Visa, L1, and E1, E2. Um, the ESSA is the one you apply for online. It, it is, it's great for those occasional one-off infrequent business trips to the state. Let's say something comes up, you need to go to New York for a conference, something like that. You can apply online. It's great. Um, if you need to go more occasionally, like we're talking like once or twice a year and everything, Come in, apply for a B1, B2 business visa to the states. It, it's great for if you need to go sign a contract. It's great if you need to go back for a trade show, stuff like that. Um, if you are, if you're looking to set up in the states, if you're looking to take your business to America, you're looking over there to go over there, set up, get paid for what you're doing. You need to review which business visa is correct for you. Um, the, the process is not very forgiving, and at that point, you're going to need to do like either an L1 or an E1, E2 business visa. And since I am the E1, E2 treaty trader, treaty investor visa guy here in London, I like to talk about that program a little bit more. Um, next slide, please. The E1, E2 treaty visa program is absolutely like a wonderful program. It's probably one of the, the best business visa programs out there, I think, worldwide. Um, Luckily, it is for America. Um, it's designed to promote trade and investment in the United States. It's, it's designed to get your businesses, we're talking small businesses, to get to the states, get you over there, and contribute to the American economy. That is the, the, the whole point of the visa. Um, it's becoming very popular with uh, foreign companies. Each day, we see dozens and dozens and dozens of businesses moving to the states. I got stacks and stacks of businesses want to move to the states on my desk even as we speak. The great IT startups, um, here in London, we get to see lots and lots of startups moving to the States, and lots and lots of startups that are expanding their operations in the States. And it is, I wouldn't necessarily say it's a tailor-made program, but it's absolutely wonderful, and your, your tech startup business will fit nicely into this program. Um, the, the selling point is it's easy to apply for. Oh, and actually, there's a mistake on the slide. They've actually recently reduced the price. It's now $205 to apply for the visa. So it's relatively cheap. Um, you get a quick turnaround here in London. We say it takes you about 90 days. Um, we can probably get you out in about 15 days. So we're talking you don't have to do the, the applications back to the states. It's not going to take you months, weeks, years on end to get your visa. You're able to get your stuff together. You're able to get it to us. We're able to review it. We'll issue a visa in a pretty short period of time, and we'll get you on the plane. We'll get you to America, and we'll get you making money and hopefully paying a little tax. Um, once again, you fly through your local American embassy. Um, to date, there is currently 80 treaties in place. This covers most of the European countries. Um, most of the European countries, Canada, Mexico, uh, Japan, South Korea. Unfortunately, um, it doesn't include the BRIC countries, so there's not a treaty in place currently between Brazil, Russia, India, or China. So uh, unfortunately, if you're from those countries, you're out of luck enough. But it does cover most of Europe. I think most of the European countries have had treaties in place. And then there's some odd ones, uh, legacy ones left over, like Iran. Iranians qualify for the visa, which uh, is, uh, says something about world politics. But um, next slide, if you would. Um, within the, the e-visa treaty class, there are two different types of, um, two different types of visas. The first one is the E-1 Treaty Trader Visa. The goal of this visa is to increase trade between the United States and uh, the foreign country. So uh, like where I'm at, um, it would be to increase trade between the United States and Great Britain. If you're, uh, if you're a French startup, it's to increase trade between France and the United States. Um, a good example of these types of businesses are like a well-established foreign company. They're looking to put like a forward sales office, someone who needs to, um, you need to sell those widgets in Wichita, Kansas, or wherever it needs to be. The E-1 visa is absolutely wonderful for you, and we'll go into the requirements in a bit. Um, my absolute favorite of the, the two is the E-2 Treaty Trader visa. It's great for foreign companies that are looking to either relocate their whole operation to the United States or to set up a, an office in the States. Tech startup businesses, 
fit into this category, absolutely lovely. We see lots and lots of tech startup companies applying for an E2 visa, moving to the States, and they do phenomenally well. Um, now I'll go into the requirements. Next slide, if you would. Um, like any good bureaucracy, there are requirements. With the E1 visa requirements, um, there has to be a trade between, there has to be a treaty in place between the United States and your country. Once again, um, most of the European countries this qualifies. Uh, most of uh, Japan, South Korea, those qualify. Um, there's a um, there's a list. You have to check the list to see if your country qualifies. Um, there are ownership requirements. At least 50% of your company must be owned by treaty nationals. For example, if you're a British company and all of your shareholders are British, then we consider your company British, it, irregardless of where it was uh, where it was. Um, initially incorporated. Um, it has to be at least 50% British owned. This is this is good for straightforward companies. It's less so for companies with uh, very complex ownership structures, but we'll help you through that. Um, the business activities have to constitute trade. We have a pretty flexible definition of what constitutes trade at this point. Um, uh, I've seen everything from eBay businesses to absolutely massive uh, tech companies, massive uh, parts manufacturers qualify for this. Also, goods trade or goods and services um, consultancy sometimes fit pretty good into this category. Um, the trade must be substantial. There actually has to be active trade like taking place, um, so it can't be a speculative business. There there needs to be trade already going back and forth, trade that's traceable going back and forth between the United States and your country. Uh, at least 50% of the trade has to take place between the United States and the treaty country. Sometimes this gets to be a little bit more problematic, trying to prove that 50% of your trade, especially for a tech startup, goes back and forth between the United States and your country. Um, um, when it comes to your employees, um, the, the people, these two, especially the E1 and the E2, these visas are for executive, essential, um, supervisorial positions. These are these are for your um, your tech gurus. These are for your uh, CEOs, your CFOs, CTOs. Th this isn't unfortunately it's not for your uh, chief sandwich maker or anything like that. Um, they they the workers need to prove that they are executive or essential, and the business would uh, would not function without them. Um, and then at the end, the final requirement is you must sign a statement that says you would promise to leave the United States and to be a good boy. Um, if you would, uh, next slide. Um, my favorite, the E2. Um, once again, this is the, the treaty investor. The idea of this treaty is to get your business to the states and to set up and to start contributing to the American economy. Um, the first two requirements are the same as the other one. There needs to be a treaty in place. Um, your company must be at least 50% owned by treaty nationals. The um, it gets a little bit more tricky when we started talking about the investment. Um, when we talk about the investment, we're not talking. We're not talking. There's no clear dollar amount. We're not saying you need to invest five hundred thousand dollars in the states. We're saying you need to invest enough money to show that you're committed to the venture. For tech startups, like sometimes this is um, this is a little bit more problematic, and we see a lot of businesses freak out about this one. If you're a if you're a small tech startup and you've put tons and tons of work into your IP, you put tons and tons of work into your development and your coding, that stuff counts towards your investment. That That is perfectly legitimate IP and document it. It counts as your investment and it will count as your investment in the States. You could take whatever you've done over here and you can apply that to your, your U.S. business. And we see lots and lots of small tech startup businesses that put a lot of time into their development over here, taking that stuff and applying it to their state side business. Um, we also look at um, the, the type of business it is. Some businesses are going to be more cash intensive. Some businesses are going to require more. What I'm trying to say is we, we look at every different type of business. We've seen, I think I've seen, I've seen more strange businesses than I could possibly imagine. Um, many of them I can't really talk about. So um, whatever your business is, we've probably seen it before. We, we probably could walk you through it, um, especially when it comes to the investment. Um, Number four, we have to, we must make sure it's a, it's a real and active commercial business. Um, this rules out your not-for-profit businesses, unfortunately your charities, um, some religious businesses. We want you to go to the states. We want it to be a real and active business. We want you to employ people. We want you to make money, and ultimately we want you to pay taxes. 
Um, the investment must be substantial, at least sufficient enough to get the enterprise off the ground. Once again, we, we look at the type of business. Um, if, you're a, if you're a tech startup and really what you're going to be doing is you're hot desking, you've got a couple laptops, um, your Starbucks card, and that's pretty much all you've got. We're going to take that into account. If you're a, if you're a much bigger business and you're going to need a lot more capital, we're going to take that into account. We look at all this stuff. Uh, we, we analyze each and every business on their own merit, and we look at these things. So um, don't freak out about the, when we say investment, don't freak out about like a dollar amount. We're not looking for a huge investment. We're not looking for $100 million. We're looking for enough money to get your business up off the ground and to make it a functional enterprise. Um, let's see, that takes us down to number six. Um, the company needs to eventually be profitable or benefit the U.S. economy. We, we want you to go to the States. We know, especially a tech startup, that's going to take you a few years. We know you're going to you're going to burn through your seed capital for quite a few years before you hopefully make a profit. We, we know all that stuff. We take all that stuff into account. We look at your finances. We, we look at your spreadsheets. We go through all that stuff. But uh, we need to see that eventually it's going to be a profitable business. Um, Eventually, the, the timeline is about five years is what we give you. I see the one else. Um, the owner of the company, the owner of the company needs to be in a position to develop and direct the enterprise. So if you're the owner of the business and you own 100% of it, you're going to be in a position to develop and direct it. If um, if there's you and your seven buddies and each of you have an equal share in the business, it gets a little bit more murky. But we uh, we could help you through that. We'll talk you through that. And uh, once again, the place must be executive. Uh, it's, executive to hold the supervisor position or have essential skills and you have to sign a letter to depart once again. Um, more than anything, um, we have, uh, I think it's on the first slide, um, go to our website, look what the requirements are. It's not that bad. America is open for business. We see lots and lots of businesses, especially little tech startups like you, moving to the states and doing well and we encourage you to do the same. Um, Please get in contact. We're we're open to discussion. We'll help you out as much as we can. There are certain requirements that we we there's certain things we can't do for you, but uh, we'll we'll let you know about that. And um, more than anything, uh, Americans open for business. Apply for visa. Move to America. Make your millions. Pay taxes. That's pretty much all I have. And okay, now I'll thank Thanks, Ben. As the last presenter, um, I just want to make sure that we kind of step back a second and make sure that everybody understands what we're trying to accomplish in this presentation. So the, this is hopefully a very practical presentation, the who, what, why, when, and where of bringing a business to the United States. The what, that's, that's your question to answer. Um, what is your business? Um, the, the why is... Um, access to capital, access to customers, um, potentially a, a better exit strategy for your business. The, the when, it's now. Um, and the, the where is something I think that, that John Bridenstine um, spent quite a bit of time giving you some tools to, to, to investigate on your own. But I'd just like to give you a little overview from my perspective. Um, one of the things about service providers in the United States that might be a little bit different than, than what you're used to is, is that we try to, to present you with solutions um, to problems that you may not even be you know, thinking that we can help you with. And so from my perspective, I spend a lot of time introducing our clients to potential investors, venture capitalists. Um, I, I'm based in the Bay Area here near Silicon Valley in California but we have offices around the country and I was in Chicago last week and I will tell you that, that Chicago is a very different um, investment climate than here in the Bay Area. Here in the Bay Area people aren't all that interested in clean technology but in Chicago they're very interested in clean technology and they have a, a focus on infrastructure, agriculture, water issues, um, more so here than we do here in California from an investment perspective. Um, so those are the kinds of things you want to think about. Um, you know, the, the, the main startup ecosystems in, in, in America are based in San Francisco, um, and this is in, in kind of decreasing order um, in terms of the volume. But San Francisco, Boston, Los Angeles, well, New York is probably right up there near the top as well. Um, Seattle um, out on the West Coast, um, Austin, Texas down in the Southwest, 
but even other places like Chicago and Atlanta, Georgia. So you're probably going to think about where to locate first. Think about where your ultimate customers are going to be um, you know, located. If you're going after enterprise customers, certainly want to think about is there a regional preference here to the U.S. in those, in those areas. Um, and then think about the investors that you might want to tap into and, and are there regional concentrations of investors based on the kind of, of business that you have. And when you think about um, the region that you're going to locate to, probably the easiest thing to do is to come over here to the states and to um, set up a, a location and a co-location center. In San Francisco, there's over 200 co-location groups, which is just a desk to rent. And so when you come over here to the United States, think about the region you want to go to, deal with the issues that John and Ben and Dan were so eloquent in terms of pointing out to you. But then as you get here, you set up your desk. We're going to talk about, since I'm on the accounting side, about some very practical issues. So you need to think about how you register your business. Once you have your business entity form, you're going to have some registration issues at the federal level, so that's the U.S. government, at the state level, that's the state that you happen to be located in, and then also at the regional level from a, a, a municipality or the city that you happen to be located in. So that, that's required once you get your business up and going, once you get established. And a firm like mine can help you with those issues, and, and even Dan's firm on the legal side can help you with some of those setups. They're, they're very straightforward, easy to take care of, and I hope you've gotten the sense from Dan and, and, and from John and from Ben is, is that if you do things right the first time, it doesn't have to be expensive and it can avoid problems down the road. So one of those important steps, and this is going to be more of a legal issue than it is an accounting issue, but it's a tax sharing agreement. So if you have a parent either in your location in the UK or wherever you happen to be um, and your US entity, you need to have an established way of determining how cash is, is shared and how revenue is shared between those entities. Um, a very common approach is a cost plus scenario. So your U.S. cost may add up to be $100,000 for a year and you might have a tax sharing agreement that says it's whatever the total costs are plus 5%. But make sure you work with a, a qualified provider in getting a tax sharing agreement in place. That's going to be an important thing as you file your tax returns, which is something that you have to do obviously in any country that you happen to be located in. So next slide, Erica. And, and we're going to kind of glance through a number of these things just to give you a, a, a heads up, um, something to be thinking about. Whatever service provider you end up turning to here in the States, you can explore these issues in more detail. Um, there are too many practical issues to come to terms with. We only have a few minutes left here, so we're just going to kind of touch on some of these things. So you know, who's going to be employed in the United States? You need to think about are they a U.S. citizen, are they a resident? or are they non-resident alien because the qualifications that they need to have to be your employee differ depending on what their status is. Then as you bring that person on board your company, do you have a formal employee relationship? Are you dictating exactly what that person is going to be doing, where they're going to be doing it? Um, are they going to be reporting to you on a detailed basis? Those are the kinds of things that construe an employee relationship. And if they're not, if you just have a project, I mean, you could have contractors in, you know, uh, anywhere in, in Europe um, working for the entity that's based here in the U.S., and that's perfectly okay. Um, there are just different kinds of tax filing requirements and tax payment requirements, depending on whether those people working for you are contractors or direct employees. And then you need to think about how you're going to pay your people, once again, this is something your service provider can help you with. Are you going to run your own payroll? There are services that here in the United States where you can actually have your employees serviced by that outside payroll provider. It makes it a lot easier. There's a little cost involved, but it's one less thing for you to have to think about. And then in terms of once you have people on board, how are you going to compensate them? Paying people a salary um, is important, and it's great because everybody has living expenses, but everybody is coming on board this startup enterprise because they want to share in the upside of the success of your business, and that's achieved through stock options, and that's a, a whole process that's both a legal and an accounting aspect to it, but it's something you need to think about as you get people on board early on in your company. Next slide, please, Erica. Um, so just following on the type of, of issues you need to think about as you bring people on board, 
the number one thing to think about is that when you come over here to the States and it's early on and you're just renting a desk in a co-location center or maybe an accelerator or something like that, you're going to be taxed based on the tax treaty that your company, your country has with the United States. If you're from the UK, basically you'll be paying UK taxes. Once you establish a permanent office, so you, you, you rent a, a particular location that you're going to call your US headquarters, that establishes what's called a permanent establishment. And at that point, it gets to be a little bit more complex in terms of how your income will be taxed. You can't just be taxed as a UK citizen once you've established that permanent establishment. Um, and the thing to think about when you come to the U.S. is there are different types of payroll taxes that you'll have to, and you know, this is just the cost of doing business, not something you need to deal with right now, but you just don't want to be surprised by these kinds of costs. So there are both employer, so if I'm paying someone a salary, I as the employer have some payroll tax obligation when I bring people on board, and that employee themselves has some taxes that they have to pay. Um, next slide, please, Erica. <coughs> So we talked a little bit about the, 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 the region, the location, what's driving your decision to come to the United States. Think about who your ultimate customers are going to be. Do you want to be close to those customers? Think about who the target investors that you might have. Um, you know, what is your vertical space? What size are you at currently? How much traction do you have with your business? That's going to dictate the kind of investors that you might want to be close to. Obviously, investors like to invest in companies where they can talk to the CEO on a regular basis and maybe come to meet with them as opposed to have to fly across the country to, to interview with them and meet with them. So, so location does have an impact on both your customer interaction as well as your investor interaction. Um, I would say that the ecosystems um, throughout the U.S., if you're coming to a major metropolitan area, Everybody understands the, the accelerator model and the co-location model, and, and every, every metropolitan area in the United States is making investments in those kinds of areas. Some are more developed than others, obviously. Um, you know, the kind of space that you come over to initially is probably going to be a co-location. There's over 200 co-location centers in, the, in San Francisco Bay Area, um, and there are many others in New York and Boston and other metropolitan areas. That's usually where people coming to the U.S. for the first time are going to come because there are other people like you there. Um, co-location is common over in U.K. I'm sure you're familiar with the concept. Can we move on? Um, and here, uh, corporate tax compliance, you know, we're running up against our, our, our time limit. Corporate tax compliance can be very complicated. The thought to, to take away from this slide is, is that if you have a good advisor, they will be able to anticipate what your issues are, what your filing requirements are. You do need to pay attention to your tax compliance obligations. If you do not make timely filings, there can be significant penalties involved, especially for foreign-based companies. So these are just a, a listing of some of the things that you need to stay on top of. Some of them are, 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 are less burdensome, um, something called a 1099 form when you have contractors. Um, that's something that's just kind of a, a, a pain point. You have to do it. If you don't do it timely, it's not a huge problem. But there are others, such as an FBAR filing, when you're a foreign individual based in the U.S. that has control over a foreign bank account, you need to make a timely filing, and if you don't, there's a $10,000 penalty for a late filing. The same thing is true between a parent and a subsidiary within the U.S. So as long as you make timely filings and they're accurate, there are no problems, it's not expensive, it's not time-consuming, but if you miss those filing deadlines, it can be uh, problematic for your business. All right. Well, thank you so much, Glenn. As you said, we're sort of up against the clock here. So I, I do have a few questions. I, I don't think we'll have time to address them right now. I, I don't want to go past the hour. But be assured that if you have asked a question, um, I will forward it on to the appropriate panelists, and we'll make sure that you get answers to your questions. And um, we'll also be sending out this deck tomorrow as well as the recording. And you see here there's the link so that you can download the guide that Dan referenced about the legal basics for um, coming to America. So that should be a really useful resource for you as well. Um, and you'll also see here on the last page that we have all the contact information for all the panelists. So use this as a reference. Feel free to reach out to everyone with any questions that you may have. Um, 
particularly if, if you didn't get a chance to enter them in the question field here, we'd love to hear from you. Um, so thank you all so much for joining us today. Thank you, Dan and Glenn and John and Ben. Um, great information, as always, really interesting and inspirational as well. Um, we have another webinar coming up, if anyone's interested. Our next one's tomorrow at, at 11 a.m. with Glenn again and talking about some more of this compliance stuff. It's about startup tax strategies. So uh, that should be a good one as well. You can go to our events page to see other upcoming events and to register for any of our webinars. So thank you again for your time and have a wonderful day, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.